So today I'm going to be giving a bit of an overview of how to run uh, the unified model with Rose and Silk. Um, so this is the newer interface that superseded the UMUI. Um, so this is used for running UM version 10 and later. Um, so if you end up running Access 2 models, uh, this is the system that gets used to uh, run those. Um, so just a bit of background before we get started. Um, the unified models, the atmospheric component of access um, developed by the Met Office. Um, it's a fairly old model, so it was started developing development in, 19, in the 1990s and sort of just been continually improved over time by the Met Office as well as the international partnership. Um, so there's a number of national institutions that contribute to the UM, um, the Met Office, uh, Korean Met Agency, uh, India's NCMWF, NIWA at New Zealand, as well as the Bureau and CSIRO in Australia. Um, so the UM is used in Australia for climate uh, modelling by CSIRO, as well as the Bureau uses it for the operational weather forecasting. The uh, thing to note is that the Unified model, unlike the other models we use, like WARF, is a proprietary model. So the centre does have a licence to use uh, the UM, uh, but only at NCI. So um, it, it's nice if you don't share the code with people outside of the centre, um, don't publish it publicly and stuff. Um, like no massive issue if you do, but that does cause problems. Um, there is some initial setup that I'm not going to go into particularly today. Um, you need to join a project at NCI called Access. Uh, we need you to register with the UK Met Office um, for access to code repositories as well as some other um, setup stuff. This is all described on the um, linked uh, URL, so you can go down here and follow the instructions to set all of this up. Um, so there's a few steps to running the UM with rows, uh, checking out the configuration, uh, setting up the model, running the model, as well as do, doing something with the output. Um, so you can do your sites. Um, the code and configuration for the UM is stored on the MetOffice's code server. Um, so this is code.metoffice.gov.uk. Um, so this includes uh, the models, uh, the, the model configurations, uh, as well as different hanging on bits like data assimilation stuff, uh, you pro primarily find used by the uh, weather agencies. Uh, we can set you up with an account for this. You just have to email us at the Climate Help website, and you can find this there, all of the UM versions, all of the documentation, things like that. Um, so CMS is able to set up model configurations to be able to run at NCI. Um, they can be sourced from CSIRO, from the Bureau, or from the Met Office or other partner agencies. As long as it's on this central code server, uh, we can set up the jobs to be run at NCI. Um, we don't deal with the Met Office's coupled configurations. So if you're wanting to run NEMO models, that's not supported at the centre currently. Um, but any of the atmospheric stuff, including the stuff submitted to CMIP-6, if it's atmosphere land only, um, that's all fine to be set up by us. Uh, we have a list of stuff that we've set up already on our wiki, which is linked here, so you can go down here. And we've got a big list of different configurations that we've set up to be able to run at NCI. Uh, so the types of configurations we have include the Access CMIP-6 submissions. So Access 2 is the uh, version of the model that gets run by Rose and Silk with this uh, Met Office code server stuff. Um, this isn't finalised yet, so you won't be able to exactly match what um, CSIRO is going to submit to uh, CMIP-6, but you can run similar sort of models at this stage. Um, 
So Access 2 is based on a model configuration called GA7 from the Met Office. Um, so that stands for the Global Atmosphere version 7 configuration. So the Met Office's naming convention for global models is just a G and then a letter for atmosphere, land, coupled. Um, GL is the land model, it's jewels. Um, lots of people in the centre will want to be wanting to run cable. Um, so as part of the access setup, you can do that as well. Uh, like I said, the coupled model with Nemo is not really supported by us. Um, it is used for seasonal forecasting at the Bureau though. Um, so there is some interest in Australia in that model. Scott, um, could I ask you to explain the difference between the UN version and the GA version, where one stops and the other starts? Sure. Um, basically, they're entirely separate. Um, so the model configuration is supposed to be code version independent, so you can run GA7, which is the configuration version, with oh. UM versions from 10.3 to 11. Um, so there's lots of different code versions as they add in updates uh, continuously at the Met Office. So just every four or six months, the Met Office releases a new code version. Uh, they do have tests and stuff to make sure that any changes in the model output is documented and as much as is practical, practical uh, those changes in the actual model output between different code versions are minimal. Um, so yeah, the, the, the configuration version is set up to be able to run with lots of different uh, model versions and the sort of overlap because people will start their science using a model configuration and, run for a few years and they'll still be able to use the latest uh, code version um, and get any improvements in um, outputs and so forth uh, from that. But is TA a section of code or is it a configuration like grid plus parameters? It's, it's the configuration, so think of it as the nameless settings. Okay, okay. Nameless settings and input files. All right, so when people talk about an updated GA, they're really talking about improved parameters. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, like the global model, there's different regional setups um, used at the center of, by a few people is this nested, uh, nested suite, which is a one-way nesting like you'd find used by WARF. Uh, where you're able to get a global model and then drill down into higher and higher resolutions within this one simulation. Um, there's also a few specialty configurations, things like the single column model, which is used for uh, testing the, the dynamics. Um, we've also set up some transpose AMIP style configurations where you can grab an initial condition from a year of interim and then use that to run the model um, from that state. Um, to access all of these configurations, there's two ways you can do it. There's a graphical browser um, that lets you search through all the different run IDs that have been set up on this uh, MetOffice code server. Um, so here we've got a few people's runs that I happen to have access to. Um, there's metadata associated with these, so you can search by, say, access in the search box and find all of the different access setups people have run um, and then use this interface to check them out into your local um, disk. Um, so these are all subversion repositories. So you've got version control, you can go back in history, uh, you can commit changes, so you've got a, a timeline of the things you've added to the model configuration. Um, so this stuff gets run uh, at NCI on the special access dev server. Um, so that connection to that is set up as part of the uh, setup instructions I alluded to earlier. Uh, but basically you log on to access dev. You can either grab this graphical interface by running Rosie Go, or you can directly check out a specific job. Say I wanted to check out this job, GA7N96UM10.6. 
I'd say Rosie copy and then this job ID which is u-ax575. Um, these job IDs don't have any particular meaning, they're just incremental uh, identifier numbers for the specific jobs in the catalogue. Um, you feed that in and then you can check out a specific configuration, edit that configuration and then run it as you desire. So once you've checked out the configuration, uh, you can then edit it, um, so change parameters, set up the outputs, that sort of thing. Um, and that's done with the ROWS edit program. Uh, jobs that we've set up will should require uh, minimal setup to changes in this ROSE edit browser to run at NCI. Um, so that's jobs listed on the wiki page I showed a bit earlier. Um, but yeah, if you want to set up specific outputs, output processing, that sort of thing, uh, you can do that in this graphical editor. Um, you can start up the editor by, if I go here on Access Dev, and I'm just in one of these rows directories, I can run rows edit, and that will bring up uh, this graphical interface where you can go in and change any settings. Uh, so this is Rose. It's basically a nameless editor. So it allows you to, to change settings in name lists uh, in, with some nice stuff around it. So you get, um, rather than typing it in manually, you get to see the different options that are available. So if you wanted to, instead of using a UM in format input file, use grid. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, changing that setting, saving it and running it. Um, so there are basically all of the options uh, you can change in the unified model. You can change here in this graphical interface. There's stuff like searches, that sort of thing, to find what you're looking for. Um, as well as you can go into the documentation on that code.net office website uh, and see uh, what the different site settings you might want to change. So if I make this a bit bigger, <coughs> excuse me. So you've got settings for reconfiguration is the input data. So if you're wanting to start at a specific time state, um, input and outputs, so setting your output fields, science settings for changing particular science options, go through in here go through into each individual setting and turn things on and off. And like I said, this is basically setting up a name list. Uh, you don't have to use the graphical editor. You can also, um, in this directory, there's these apps, UM, oops, if I go into app slash UM, there's this roseapp.conf. And this is basically all of those same nameless settings. Uh, so here we've got, this is for output fields, but you see name list, whatever name it is, and you can manually change settings here as well. If you want to say script something to map bulk edit the output options, um, that's easy enough to do. That's, it's supposed to be more flexible than the old UMUI was. Uh, in the UMUI, you had to use this, use the graphical editor for everything. So bulk changing or copying settings from one job to another was very slow. Um, this is supposed to make that a bit of a smoother process. Go back here. So yeah, the when you run the model, those text in each cell files are converted into nameless files that are fed into the model. Um, so that directory I show is set up, split up into several things. There's these apps, which are basically jobs getting run by the run on Rigen. So you have the UM is the actual atmosphere model. There's also FCM underscore make, 
which is the build configuration. If you're changing optimization levels, things like that, that can be handy to take a look at as well. Um, you've also got a variety of other stuff in here. You can add general scripts just in a bin directory and be able to run those from, from jobs within the suite. Oops. Yeah. Here we are. Uh, set up for that GUI is in the metadata is in the metadata directory, um, and then you've got the global metadata. So stuff in this rose suite.info file. If I get out of this, so this is metadata that gets seen by that catalog. So the Rosie Go catalog, you can add in your own information here and be able to find it. You can set up a project. If you're collaborating with people and want to easily find each other's files, stuff like that. Um, there's also the suite.ic file, which is what gets fed into the job scheduler, which is called Silk. And Silk organizes the separate jobs within your model run. Uh, these are all documented um, in the Rose and Silk documentation, which you can find by following these links. Oh. Hey, Hi. Okay, so you've checked out a specific configuration for the run, and you've set up the model with Rose Edit to add any output files, that sort of thing, output fields, that sort of thing. Uh, you can then run the model with Rose Suite Run. Um, there's two ways to do that. If we go into this GUI, we can just press the play button and that will start things wrong. Hopefully. <laughs> Let's background it. There we go. Oops. <laughs> oh, well. we're getting a bit of noise from your microphone. Anyway, you press the play button and that brings up the graphical editor, the, the uh, scheduler. You can also go rows sweet run from within the directory. Shut this down first. So I'm just going to copy and paste um, my test run. Shut it down. And then we have to wait a little bit and say row sweet run. So this is exactly the same as pressing play in that graphical interface. And it will start everything running. Hopefully, yes, here we go. So this is Silk. Um, it's basically a job scheduler, uh, like you'd see with in PDS or in your QSub a job. Um, but it also handles dependencies between individual jobs. So it knows that you want to build the model before you run it, and you want to run February before you run uh, March. Um, so it, it allows you to schedule specific dates in the model run. Um, as well as general things, this happens before that. It's most useful for things like MWP, where you're getting observations coming in at random times. This thing is checking for those observational files coming in, adding them into the model and continuing from there. Uh, for climate style runs, where you're just running one month after the other, it's a bit overkill, um, but we use it just to be consistent with everyone else. Um, so let's show you this. So this is a graph of the tasks within the Silk Run. Uh, so this is what the what the model is doing. So it is downloading the model source code uh, on ride, and it's submitting a job where it's going to build that model source code to create the model executable. Um, it processes the input files to make it suitable to be read in by the model runs the model, um, here it's just running for one month, um, and then cleans up after itself, so archives, log files, things like that. 
Um, so as it goes through, these things will each, yeah, these things will each respectively turn uh, light green means it's been submitted. So currently this job, I can even go on to Rygen and I should be able to, oops, go on to Rygen and say QSTAT me. And we can see this job is submitted onto the queue. And that will process down as the uh, individual parts of the model get run. Same thing. So yeah, the model split, split up into these things, either called tasks or apps, that get run and scheduled by this job scheduler. Hi, Scott. Can I ask a quick question? Of course you can. Um, where do you set the KSU units then when you're submitting the job? Sure. Um, so that is set up in some of the configuration files. So for this instance, I believe it is site NCI region. So this file sets all of the settings that is going to be used by the um, scheduler. Uh, generally things like uh, num process and decomposition and stuff you can edit in that graphical interface, so the rows edit so you don't have to go into this sort of thing. Uh, but if you're wanting to manually edit it, um, so Atmos resources, resources used in the atmosphere model. Um, and these are the options that get fed into your EBS run script. So you could go and say, instead of using their default things, let's change this to 32 gigabytes and so forth, and that'd get fed into the job scripts. Um, you can also, if the job gets run and it's, it's run out of memory, in order to quickly um, alter things, you can go in, right click on one of these jobs, Right click works. Anyway, there's an option to edit the run script interactively. So you can go in, change the settings just for that one run, run and then submit it um, if you end up running out of resources. Uh, for general cases, though, it would be just in that um, graphical editor. Uh, If we take a look here, should be able to go to Sweet Conf is global general configuration, not specific to a uh, model's name list. So this is things like environment variables and, <coughs> and PBS settings. Uh, let's see, machine options. Yeah, so here you can set things like the HPC queue you're using. This is, uh, NCI queue would be the one to use here. This is the Met Office's queues. Um, so yeah, you could change instead of using Broadwell queues, use Express queue, that sort of thing. Um, it defaults to, in this setup, two gigabytes per CPU. So if you request 200 CPUs, it's gonna request 400 gigabytes of memory. Um, but like I said, you can't change that. Okay, um, so you can also use that uh, Silk interface to control jobs. You can stop them, start them, that sort of thing by right-clicking. So this is dark green, which means it's running. If we wanted to kill that job, I don't know why my right-click is not working. Oh, there we go. We can right-click it and say, kill the job. And that will log on to Rygen, run a QDEL on that specific job um, and stop it. Do that. So there we go. Now it's no longer in the queue. Similarly, you can submit a job if it's fail. Red means failure here. And say either trigger 
or trigger with edits. So this is where I said you can go in and manually change the, the configurations. So this is the JavaScript that's actually getting run. So you can edit this, um, add in more mem memory or whatever you're wanting to do. And then once you've fitted, finished editing, it will say, do you want to submit this? And say yes. And it's back submitted. It waited in the queue to run. Uh, you can also stop the entire thing by going control, stop, or just pressing the stop sweep button. There are a few options here. You can just stop silk and leave everything running in that's in the queue uh, by running uh, stop now. Or you can, if you just want to scrap the whole thing, kill everything that's running in the queue. So queue del everything that's currently running and then hit execute, exit silk cleanly. And that means everything stopped. That's these options here. So the silk writes to a separate directory from the rows directory where you set up the configuration. So it by default sets outputs to tilde silk run, depending on whether the task gets run on access dev for things like checking out the model source code or origin for actually running the model, you'll find it on either of those computers. Um, so you can drill down and find the logs of individual tasks as well as their work directories. Um, so Silk assigns a separate work directory to each task. And there's also this share directory, which is where output from the model goes. So this is the output directory from a Silk run. In this case, it's a coupled model run. Um, and you have this work directory. Zoom in. So this work directory is where individual jobs get run. Uh, so we can see work, the date that it's being run at, and then say the coupled run. This is where all of the nameless files actually get created. And output will normally go into share, uh, share data, history data. So this is where all of the output files from the model are getting saved with all of the uh, data variables that you set up in the model configuration. Um, there's also log files. Your normal PBS style standard output standard error are in log, job, whatever. Let's say make mon, which is the ocean component, job.air. So this will be your standard error. Oops, let's finish. You can also get this from the Silk interface by right clicking on a particular task that's completed. And then you can view the standard output or standard error. So once you've got the, once you've done the run and you've uh, got output like I was showing before, you probably want to do something with that output. Uh, the UM outputs in a binary format. Um, it's generally not worth your time trying to read that directly. Instead, you want to try and convert that to NetCDF. Um, if you just wanted to quickly view it, there's a tool called XCon, which is under tiller access slash bin. Um, so that allows you, like NCView would, just to quickly see what's in, in a file. So if I go to the output directory, which I said was uh, share data, history data, and I say, look at this January file, uh, the UM can output into different file streams here you've got an A stream, a B stream, a C stream, a D stream, so forth. And then there's a timestamp after that name. Um, there's a whole, whole thing on how you encode the dates in these files. Um, so we can run tilde access 
slash bin slash xcom on year one January. See what's in that in that file. So here we get a list of each of the fields in the file. Um, these are not like CF names or anything. These are just what the UM calls them. So you can select an individual field by double clicking on it, or you can select multiple fields. So we can say the U component on, of the wind on the P grid and plot that dial just to get a good idea of is there any artifacts in here? Is this data totally bunk or is it reasonable? Um, so that's a nice quick view there. Um, and once you've got the output and you're wanting to convert it to NetCDF, um, I like to use Iris, which is a Python library um, in our Conda environment. So module code Conda here, because I've already got the module use running. And we can say Iris to NetCDF, uh, let's say the A stream again. All right. Out.nc. And this is using a tool developed by the Met Office to do to convert between UM format to NetCEF and add in proper CF metadata. What does the dash arrow do? Uh, it's just the output file. Oh, just that. Yeah, so I'm just creating a file called out.nc with the input of uh, this UM file. Um, there are quite a number of tools around, hanging around for converting between UM format and NetCDF. Um, this is just what I want to use. I like to use. There's more tools listed on our wiki. So it's just going to take a little bit of time while it sorts everything out. Another neat thing about Iris is it can use the orography if you've got that saved into the output field and calculate the proper heights from that instead of using model levels. So while that's running, let's continue. So as well as using that command line tool, you can script it in Python. If you want to individually process particular fields, you can load a file with Iris, um, extract specific, specific fields, and then save those specific fields to NetCDF. Or um, instead of saving to NetCDF, you can convert these Iris cubes into X-ray objects and then work using X-ray. Iris includes its own data processing stuff. Um, I find X-Ray uh, easier to use, um, but if you're interested in taking a look at the processing that Iris can do, um, take a look at their documentation. And that's still running. Um, but there is a file I've already created, and if I do module load NC view, NC view, this far, we can then see the X-ray uh, information of that file, or NC dump dash H on the file to get the data. So then that has things like the standard names, um, that sort of deal. So CF style metadata, that you can go and take a look through. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty quick overview of uh, running the UM. Um, as always, you can get in touch with us um, for help with running the model, um, either over email or in person. Um, so yeah, thank you. And were there any questions? Um, I wanted to ask about adding new output. Mm -hmm. 
Is that done by, I think it's done by editing some file. But yeah. I've also heard there's some stash codes or variable names or something. Yeah, that's right. So the UM fix of variables in these things called stash codes, which are just numbers. Um, it doesn't store like variable names or anything. Um, so there is a file defining what these stash codes are. Um, if we take a look at tilde access, umdir, a model version, so version 2.6, full data, stash master, stash master A. This is where all of these are defined by the model. So we have the U component of wind is stash code 02, um, and so forth for all of these fields within the model. Um, so to set up that, so if we want to say output, we want to output, say, the U component of wind after time step in a file. So this is a reasonably complicated thing, working out how this stuff works. So again, feel free to ask questions if you try this and can't figure it out. Okay. So to do, to output a field, we have to create a stash request. So we say, we want to output this field with a specific processing. So that can be things like monthly, monthly meaning, which is done within the model rather than a, as a post-processing step. So we add a new stash request. So this, this interface here is the same as that text file I was showing. So we can go in here, primary fields, Item two is so the U component of wind, or we can also filter wind. Um, there's different sections depending on whether you want the primary field, uh, the or um, diagnostics as it's run as the model's running. So this is the increase in convection in the U wind. So we just want this one. Add it. Okay, so we've got our new field. Uh, we then need to set the domain. So this is things like, do we just want to extract the field over Australia or over the whole world? Do we want to extract specific model levels? Um, so, say all row levels here, uh, individual, um, configurations will have their own domain set up according to whoever originally did, did the setup. So all row levels and a time processing. So previous ones using a six hourly sampled monthly mean, I would guess that means. Uh, say we want the daily maximum. So we want the daily maximum on all row levels and then this use. Remember how I said the output files are in different streams, A, B, C, D, and so forth? That's what this is. It's saying which of the output files is this going to go into. And that's basically useful for clustering, for um, organising your outputs. So if you want all your daily means in one file and all your monthly means in a different file. Um, so that would go into file D. Um, if you want to set up your own processing, you can also do that. So if you wanted to edit, take a look at what this six, uh, six hour mun e, m was, we'd go into the time profile for that. Um, so this is a time mean over 30 days, sampling at six hours. Um, outputting at regular inter intervals of 30 days from 30 days from the 30th day. So you can set up all of your time means and stuff similar for levels. You can set up in quite a lot of detail how you want the data to be processed and that's done as the model runs. So you don't need to save lots of output and do the post processing later. Um, hopefully that gives an overview. Like I said, if you need help, ask us. 
um, because this is all not very detailed. And we're happy to help out setting things up. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, as Thank usual. You. Thank you, Scott. As usual, this should be recorded on our YouTube channel, so that will come up either this afternoon or tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you.